You know, some of my friends uh, tease me and say, well, Lars, you really, you can't speak on anything else than Acts 7, can you? Uh, well, I hope I can <laughs> after many years of teaching and, and preaching and so on. But, but this was, as, as you heard, the, the topic, the area of my uh, PhD. And uh, out of that has come a number of different ways of presenting the material. And this is the way it is for this specific network. So as you can see, it's Paul in Athens as an apologetic model. And I think we need to be clarify what we mean about that, because really it, it's both relating to why did Luke record this passage? So did Luke consider it as a model? So what, what did Paul say and how did he approach this? And to what extent did Paul himself consider it, this as a model? And for us today, how may we apply this? Um, and can we find other scripture references that helps us to understand this in a, in a, in a helpful way? So that's the kind of, <clears throat> of, of, of uh, approach here. And uh, I've divided this into approaching, analyzing and applying. So it's about when we approach this as a key passage about apologetics, what is a helpful way into this to understand this very famous passage. Paul in Athens, Acts 17, 16 to 34. It's the most widely used biblical passage in popular apologetics. I think it's hard to come across any kind of material book on biblical material, you know, without the mentioning of Act 17 and its significance, and rightly so, I think. But then it doesn't mean that it's based, the, the usage of it is based on a sufficient understanding of it. Uh, I think we get some of the picture quite clearly. You know, we could compare this to what, what, what Pete has shared with us so wonderfully in the, in, the, in the Bible studies, Bible readings, uh, that you can read a, a biblical story like a parable, rather straightforward in a way. At one level, it's, it's accessible for all of us with some, some help. But there's also layers of understanding there that increases the value of understanding a passage if you know some of the, the references, some of the cultural references, some of the scripture references, and so on. So I think that's a, a good way into this. And I would like to start by emphasizing, I've come across five popular misunderstandings of Paul's speech in Athens. They are not, not equally important, but I think it's helpful to, to try to get the overview. So first of all, you may have come across Bible translations or that talks about Paul's on Mars Hill, the Mars Hill speech. Well, you know, the word the Mars is the, the Latin for Ares, that's the war god. So the point is Mars Hill then claims that Paul was standing on that little hill called the Ares Pagos, Areos Pagos, uh, or Mars Hill. Well, I am convinced that Paul did not, the likelihood is that Paul did not stand on that hill, but was engaging with the Areopagos Council in the Agora, in the marketplace. Um, and you know, you had a square with the colonnades around. I'm sure you can envision that. And, and everything happened there, you know. There was a place of education, place of sports, place of philosophical debate, place of leisure, business. Um, so it was the hub of the city in many ways. And it makes sense that we know that the Oropagus Council was meeting in the Agora most of the time at the time of Paul. That's one of the indications. Secondly, when Paul engaged with, was invited to, to speak to the, uh, to the Oropagus Council, was that a formal legal defense? Did he, you know, was he accused? So did he have to defend himself? 
Well, I don't think that is the most fruitful way of approaching it. Um, the most fruitful way is to, to, to understand the role of the Areopagus Council at the time, where one of their roles was to, was to give license, so to speak, to speakers or to heralds of foreign gods. So as you, as we'll come, when we, we'll come to the passage itself in, in just a couple of minutes, uh, you will see that Paul is seen as a herald of foreign gods. Foreign from the perspective of the Athenians, of course. Uh, so it does make sense. And they would be, uh, to, to look at it from that perspective. And also, then they would be concerned about, is there a need for a new altar that might, you know, increase the economy of Athens at the time? And, the, you know, helpful sort of business activity, uh, religious business activity, so to speak. Um, so what is, who is this strange Jew, Jewish rabbi who is coming into the context there? Then when we look at Paul's speech, you may have come across in missionary, mission studies literature, it's referred to sometimes as a missionary primer, by that meaning that it gives us a, a wonderful example of the first time the Christian faith is, is, is presented to an audience. Well, if we look carefully at the passage, it's not the first time Paul communicates about the Christian faith. It says he, pre he preached about Jesus and the resurrection in the Agora. And then there were questions, there were objections, and there were people belo had, you know, belonged to different worldview alternatives. Uh, uh, and, and two philosophical schools are mentioned. You know, there's a whole setting there. So it's actually a follow-up speech, clarifying relating to questions in an engaging way, relating to objections, relating to worldview alternatives. Some people would furthermore then, then, then say that this is actually seems to be a failure. It's not like Pentecost, you know, when thousands came to faith. Well, if we are honest, I don't know if, if <laughs> is that our everyday experience, that, we, that you know, the, the, the standard experience of, of mission Every, every instance is like a Pentecost experience. Well, I wish it were in many ways, <laughs> but, but I suppose that is not how most Christian evangelism and mission is. So I think it's a realistic picture of an outreach <laughs> that emerged, maybe not planned strategically, but emerged there. And, and we can relate to that, I think, in a meaningful way. Some people call it a failure because they interpret it in view of 1 Corinthians 2, uh, where Paul says, when I came to you in Corinth, which was immediately after Athens, it was not, I did not come with words of wisdom, but in weakness. So some people say, aha, Paul is now denouncing what he did in Athens. Now he has learned his lesson. He is growing in sanctification. <laughs> he is uh, approaching, you know, without philosophical jargon, some would say. Well, I think that is to misunderstand 1 Corinthians 2, because that is not pointing backwards, it's pointing forwards towards Corinth, saying that Paul had to make a resolute commitment not to compromise with the gospel when encountering Corinth, which was a very different city in cultural terms. Athens was a city of learning, you know, an insignificant city at the time, politically, military, but a very significant city still in intellectual, cultural terms. And then fifthly, some people would say it's an isolated passage. It doesn't belong to, you know, to an overall picture. Well, I don't think that's the case. And here is why. Uh, Paul in Athens, <laughs> as, an, as an apologist, actually fits the overall purpose of Luke and Acts. You may recall, you know, the preface to Luke's Gospel, where, where, where Luke writes to Theophilus, saying that he wanted them to know how credible the Gospel is. 
And then he relates to that in the preface to the brief preface to, to Acts, the book of Acts. And then he's actually uh, saying that, that uh, um, you know, by, through telling the story in, in the book of Acts of the gospel from Jerusalem onward, like the circles on the water, he, he's, the gospel is being exposed and is over against one world, the alternative after another, one context after another. So it fits Luke's purpose of telling the credibility of the gospel story, the credibility of the gospel message, and the credibility of the gospel commitment. We'll come back to that. Secondly, there is an overall pattern in Acts where we see that Paul um, and so, uh, the others as well, they have kind of a double approach. In the synagogue context, they start, of course, with Scripture, moving to Jesus as Messiah. In context outside the synagogue, they start with creation, with a shared humanity. And I think that's to indicate already, that's one of the takeaways, I think, for us from Acts 17, is that Paul is actually emphasizing the shared humanity. We are all living in God's world. I've already emphasized that it fits Luke's picture of Paul in the Agora as a herald of foreign gods. And very interestingly, it fits Paul's own statements in his letters. Of course, 1 Corinthians 9, you know, becoming a Jew for the Jews and a Greek for the Greeks. Uh, but also 1 Thessalonians 1, which is probably written at about the same time as, Luke, as Paul visited Athens. And we hear about turning from idols to the living God. Talking about repentance and expecting, uh, uh, turning to, to God and expecting uh, the Lord um, Jesus Christ coming back and serving him. And then we have Romans 1, a very important uh, uh, passage about, uh, about general revelation, which is an important passage. And, and I think we could also, alongside this, emphasize Acts 14 specifically, where Paul is in Lystra. And we could have spent, actually, our time only on that passage as well. It's so rich, where Paul, for example, says that it is God who gives us joy in our hearts. So he's not speaking to Christians. He's not, what a joy we have in Jesus, you know? But that, of course, is a deeper joy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an even more meaningful and deeper joy. But what, what Paul is talking about is that every human being relates in reality ontologically, you know, as, as the reality is to our creator. And joy, however that is experienced, is a gift from our creator. I think that's a wonderful point of contact. We have touched on 1 Corinthians 2 already. So let's move from this introductory bit, how to approach it, to Paul in Athens. Uh, and the, the, the passage as such, and the passage falls naturally into a narrative introduction, the speech, and the narrative conclusion or epilogue. So let's start with the narrative introduction, verses 16 to 21. And we have already indicated that the Athenian agora, the marketplace, is the context and the focus of Luke when he retells the story. He's only using half a verse on the synagogue ministry. We don't know how much Paul was there, but obviously that is not the focus when Luke is retelling this story. The focus is Paul's wider context there in the specific Athenian uh, Agora context. The context of focus. And, you know, the Athenian Agora has actually been called by some historians as the first mass media in the world. You know, the first place where ideas were distributed to people who came. And there is this fascinating verse 21. Have you noticed that verse? 
It's Luke commenting, saying, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That could be said about our culture today, couldn't it? Uh, we have so much focused on the here and now, you know, the immediacy of the day, the social media, the news, uh, uh, you know, the, the entertainment media. But there is also, you know, an irony here in this narrative aside from, from Luke. Okay, they are, they are concerned about the news. But when the most important news, the gospel, the good news, the evangel, the good news, which we heard about yesterday evening, you know, about the identity, evangelical identity, um, the good news of the gospel, which is the most fantastic news ever, do they actually realize that? So th I think this is inserted there by, by Luke as a reminder that being concerned about new things doesn't necessarily mean that that they are being attracted to the really drastic, fresh, most fantastic and explosive news ever, the news of the gospel. The whole emphasis in verses 16 to 21 are on the Athenian questions to what Paul is bringing there, the Athenians' objections, their misunderstandings, and the different worldview alternatives. Again, it's a very rich, a very condensed, condensed text. Let me just highlight to exemplify this. Um, verse, let's read from verse 16 and onwards. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And let me just mention to you, that the word greatly distressed is a very um, emphatic word. It's, it, it's about being provoked in your spirit. It's the same word as, you, as is used in the Old Testament for that God is jealous. God doesn't tolerate any rivals. So it's when Paul is seeing not just the beauty of Athenian culture, but he sees underlying the idolatry. He sees that God is not given the glory. So, so again, it's a spiritual reality here that is there from the very beginning. But how is that followed up by Paul? By, let's continue verse 17. So he reasoned after he was provoked in the spirit. He did apologetics. Isn't that interesting? So there is no dichotomy between the spiritual side and the apologetic, the, if you want, the more intellectual side. There is a coherence. It belongs together. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing God Greeks and nothing more in the synagogue. And then as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happen to be there. You know, being a media man, I would love to have had reports from those conversations, you know, when Paul was interacting with one and the other. And we have a few glimpses here. A group of Epicurean Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? So very condescending from, you know, from, from above. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Do you see? Herald of foreign gods. But why on earth should someone get the impression that Paul was communicating a message of foreign gods in plural? That's an interesting question, I think, isn't it? Well, Luke gives us the explanation. He continues. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and Anastasia. The resurrection, about the male God, Jesus. Okay, it's a male noun. And the female noun, Anastasia. So here is the impression they have. It's like, aha, this Jewish rabbi is coming with a fascinating message. Jesus, whoever that is, and Anastasia, life. Fascinating. 
So there is some comfort. Even Paul was misunderstood. Um, and Paul is then engaging with them, and he's being invited. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning at this point that what Paul is sort of doing here, he's, when he speaks, he's relating to the different groups in a very meaningful way. So, you know, in this introductory part, we see the background for that. It's meant to give us a, the clues to how to understand the speech. And um, N.T. Wright, uh, a famous British uh, uh, author, theologian and, 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 and previous bishop, he talks about that Paul is like a super, a, a famous sort of a chess master. You know, are you interested in chess? Maybe not, maybe yes. Uh, and there, you know, you may be aware of there's a famous Norwegian chess player called Magnus Carlsen, who's one of the best chess players in the world, they say. Um, and and uh, Tom Wright says here that Paul is like that, you know, like a famous chess master coming to a city and the local chess club, uh, you know, um, takes all their most promising people and they sit, have you seen that, sit at different tables and then the chess master goes one draw there, one draw there and sometimes even blindfolded, you know, because it turns out that even though they are good and are uh, I wouldn't have a chance to, for, you know, com competing to, uh, to, uh, with any one of them. They are much, much lower in standard. So he is able to relate to one after another. And Tom Wright uses that picture. Paul is like that, being able to relate to the Stoics, relate to the Epicureans, relate to the Aeropagus Council, relate to the polytheists, and the other being present. And I think that is a lesson for us to take away. Uh, that whenever we publicly communicate the gospel, there will always be a mixture of people present. And we need to be aware of that spectrum in the audience. Or, it, we, or if we do it in writing, it maybe even more. You know? there is, we don't know who will read this. And we need to be, be aware of how, how this is perceived. Okay, so Paul then is being invited, and there's probably a break of a couple of days maybe. He prepares a speech, and we know that Paul was very skilled in rhetorics, uh, you know, in, in the art of speaking. Um, and then they said, Paul, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagos and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. In every way. Very polite. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Again, the word religious is very interesting because it can both mean positively, ah, you are religious people, that's good. Or you are religious, aha, you are superstitious people. So depending on the context or on the perception of the listeners. So Paul is introducing an ambiguous word there that may mean either or. Fascinating in terms of communication. And then he says, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Paul was walking around. He was looking for where is there a point of contact? Where can I build the bridge with the gospel? And he found this mysterious altar to an unknown God. And, you know, has been written a lot. And I mean a lot on that. Probably, you know, something like that. But just to briefly indicate three possible ways of taking that. One would be that Paul is actually positively affirming their longing for something beyond this reality. He is affirming the religiosity as something. Yes, it's good to be aware of something beyond this, not to be limited just to the material world. Okay, so there is a possible here affirmation of their religious longings. Okay, but if this altar to an unknown God is affirmed by God, and God is rightly, from their perspective, 
unknown because they, they don't know the scriptures, you know, so far, and they haven't heard the gospel so far. Not at least in depth or, 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 or for a long time. So then, the question is, if this altar to an unknown God is right, what about all the other altars? So Paul then is connecting to Socrates and the Socratic tradition of the critique of idolatry. Uh, there was a strong philosophical tradition. Uh, you know, the philosophers, um, uh, they, they were, uh, you know, there were wisdom in, in the best philosophers in that sense. They understood that it's futile to worship something that made by human hands. Why should we do that? Because that is lesser than humans, no? It, it, it's below us as humans. We should always think about worship something that is beyond us. So Paul is connecting, okay, affirming a religious longing, and then secondly, implicitly critiquing the other altars for being false because they are claiming knowledge about God. And then thirdly, Paul is probably relating to a old story, a story of um, something hit the city, maybe a plague or something hit the city hundreds of years before this. And this is probably a rather you know, uh, legendary story, but, but still I think it was in the imagination of, of, of the Athenians at the time. And, and uh, what did the Athenians do? Well, they thought the gods have judged us. Okay. Zeus and all the others, you know? But how would they know which god that was behind this? Well, as a safety precaution, it was said, they had to build an altar to an unknown god because it would may be that there was someone, some god they didn't know that was behind this calamity. So it's like a safety precaution, you know, uh, um, which is very interesting. So Paul establishes a point of contact in the altar, and later on he quotes, as you probably know, poets, and, and those two are like bridge heads, you know, into the culture. And on the basis of that, we find a threefold argument where Paul starts with saying, the Judeo-Christian view of God explains reality much better than any other worldview. That is what I call natural theology argument. So, so it's like a taken together today, you know, in, in philosophical term, we could talk about cosmological, you know, teleological, moral argument, all that taken together, you know, that explains the reality much better than any other worldview. But if God is the creator of, of everything, of the universe, if God is the author of life, he has authority over life. So, he has copyright to everything, to use our modern term. Ultimate authority resides with him. If God is the author of life, he has ultimate authority over life. But God has not left us without witness. The unknown God has made himself known. And then there Paul comes back to Jesus and the resurrection having introduced a, a biblical worldview perspective, foundation, without quoting the Old Testament explicitly once. But of course, the whole passage is permeated. You know, the whole passage is based on, 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 on things like Isaiah 40, 41, 42, and, and the prophet's critique of, of idolatry and so on. So it's not that it's not biblical, but it doesn't presuppose accepting biblical authority before accepting biblical truth. And then Paul moves on to challenging belief and behavior. And he, he has already introduced implicitly judgment, divine judgment through the reference to the altar, as I mentioned. So the concept of judgment towards the end of the speech is not a foreign concept then in the conversation. Okay, I'm actually presuming that you know the passage quite well. So, so I'm referring to the passage to, to save time and not 
because if I had double time, I would read the passage, I would comment on it. Could we have the questions afterwards? Thank you for that. Uh, and then Luke's um, conclusion then. It's fascinating again. It's a combination of this dual reaction, which is the normal pattern in Acts. Some scorn, some reject, others are interested. Hoi men, hoi de in Greek, you know, on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand. So, so it's, and I think again, that's a realistic pattern. Some people are rejecting, some people are being attracted to it. And among those attracted, it's interest and it's a, a, a genuine conversation starts and conversions happen in a very challenging context. And of course, it's, the passage is world famous. Even in, did you, do you remember the, 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 the Norwegian author, Justin Gorder, who wrote Sophie's World? Uh, the history of philosophy in just one book written for children. Absolutely amazing. And, and re reading his one or two page account of this is just brilliant. You know, he says, when the, 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 the Christian faith touched, reached, Hellenistic culture. That's the moment. Okay, so we have talked about approaching, analyzing, and now let's indicate some lessons from Paul in Athens, something about how to apply it. In our various apologetic ministries today. And let me, first of all, use these two um, symbols. It's from Os Guinness's book, Fool's Talk, and he says that there are two traditions in, um, in the history, in, the, in, in, the, in how the church has been doing apologetics throughout history. One is the symbol of the open hand, and that's the rhetorical emphasis of open invitation, open-handed, the creative exploration where the closed fist is not hitting someone, it's emphasizing, it's making an argument. And remember that apologia and everything, almost, well, except for a couple of passages, all passages emphasizing apologetics in the New Testament are from a legal background, legal terminology. So it's about setting forth your case, making an argument, presenting an argument. And we need both the open hand and the closed fist. And Osgini says, the closed fist represented the dissuasoria, the negative side of apologetics that used all the highest strengths of human reason in defense of truth. Mustering all the power of reasons, logic, evidence, and argument, closed fist apologetics had the task of answering every question, countering every objection, and dismantling false objections to the faith and to knowing God. Whereas the way of the open hand represented the persuasoria, the positive side of apologetics that used all the highest strengths of human creativity in the defense of truth, expressing the love and compassion of Jesus and using eloquence, creativity, imagination, humor, and irony, open-handed apologetics had the task of helping to pry open hearts and minds that for a thousand reasons had long grown resistant to God's great grace so that it could shine like the sun beautifully expressed by Os Guinness. And the point is, if we apply this open hand and closed fist to Acts 17, what could we say? Well, the open hand. How could we approach the Paul's, use Paul's argument just to take one of the aspects here? Well, in terms of natural theology, many people have a sense of a wonder. How can we build on that, connect with that, you know, when someone gets their first child or second, you know, this sense of wonder. When, you know, up in the Norwegian or Swiss or, or Austrian mountains you know, or wherever there are mountains, you know, looking at the majestic mountains or where, you know, this sense of awe, of majesty, there is something deeply meaningful there. And we all have views on authority. That's the second dimension. How can we explore that? Um, uh, you know, we, we all rely on authorities, but where does that stop? Where does authority actually 
reside ultimately. And not the least, the reality of death, Jesus and the resurrection. Someone very close to me got a message last week about a very serious rebound of cancer in my immediate family. Um, and of course, what does the reality of death mean? We all encounter that. And I think it's so absolutely fantastic that the message of resurrection touches us where we are most vulnerable, at the point of death. That's where God comes with his message. That's where the life-giving message of the, of the gospel comes. Talks about the, not just the reality of death, but the reality of hope and eternal life. So, you see, the open hand is exploring softly, creatively, imaginatively. Whereas the way of the closed fist is the arguments. And maybe that's our usual take on apologetics is emphasizing the arguments. And they belong, they are central to the, within the whole picture. But it's not the only part of the picture. In this case, there are so many good arguments for a, for a creator. I heard a reference to the, um, I haven't seen it, but to the unbelievable podcast between uh, where Justin Brierley uh, interviewed had a debate between Francis Collins and, and, and Richard Dawkins, I think a week ago or something was released, where Richard Dawkins admitted that the fine-tuning argument is a very strong argument. If he was to believe in God, that would probably be the reason, he said. And that's quite a statement from him. But you see, the force of the arguments may be very strong. And I think it's a wonderful line here, if God is the creator. He has ultimate authority. The author of life is, has authority over life. So I think we need to ground the morality in the fact that God is who he is. And of course, Jesus and the resurrection, arguing for the credibility. A friend of mine, a young minister, did his master's thesis on the credibility of, 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 of the resurrection. And parallel to that, he was uh, appearing in a reality show in Norway, uh, being a young, newly ordained minister. And he, had this, he has this charming attitude of relating to any and everyone. So he was, treat, you know, people asked him to bless him and to, you know, whatever, to pray with him, genuinely relating to people in that reality show, primetime television. And this Easter, um, a video series on YouTube was released where he presented three episodes on why I believe in the reality of the resurrection. And on Easter Day, he was the, uh, the, the, the service from his parish with his, him as a preacher on, on Easter Sunday on the equivalent of BBC um, NRK1, you know, national television. So there are opportunities. There are opportunities. Let us use them because we do have a very, very good case. But remember, it has to be not just the open hand, not just the closed fist, but the combination of the two. Finally, the whole emphasis of Luke's gospel and of Luke's second volume is to show the credibility of the faith to the Theophilus and all Christian readers and beyond that afterwards. And I think we mustn't, we mustn't uh, underestimate the role of apologetics in strengthening believers, affirming and equipping believers. So reading this story, yes, it is a model for reaching out, but it also does something with us. It evokes something in us. It affirms the gospel story. It affirms the gospel truth or the worldview of the gospel, and it affirms the commitment to the gospel, the faith, and its equipping for discipleship and witness. So with that as a background, here are four questions that you may want to reflect further on. Have you come across any of the misunderstanding that we was heard of, that I presented? Uh, uh, misunderstandings of Acts 17. 
Why do you think Act 17 is so popular? Were there any new discoveries, any surprises for you in the exposition of Act 17? How would you personally apply Act 17 as an apologetic model in view of the last part of the talk? And maybe for this, for the, for the network, the fourth question should be the focus and the other one are background questions, I think.